Thank you, Soan, and welcome everyone to our Cloud Zendo, Cloud Dharma Hall. Um, I've got the live transcript going, and I see Tucson. I must have said something. I'll turn that off. Um, tonight, we wanted to uh, welcome everybody in the SCPT, Socially Engaged Buddhist Training, who are here with us in the Zoom room, 88 of you, as well as those of you who are on Zoom watching um, all around the world, another 48 of you. And, uh, and tonight we're talking about the Nomads Clinic, which is our uh, pilgrimage and service expedition to the Himalayas that we usually do in the fall of each year, um, but didn't go last year. And we're not sure about this year. Um, but I wanted to share uh, a slideshow and some, some little videos and uh, clips with you and tell some of the stories um, and show some of the images from, from our time there. And I have uh, Roshi Joan here with Wendy Lau um, to help uh, tell that story. Um, and I'm just going to post a, a link now. I'm going to start the slideshow with this video. And I'm posting the link in case for some reason the, um, the video quality is not good or it's jerky or something. You can switch to the link that I just put in the YouTube stream and the, in the chat stream. Noah, I think it'd be wonderful um, just to, uh, um, before we look at the video, to just uh, say that um, the spirit of this work is uh, really based in practice and in uh, practice as compassionate action. And um, it, it, the work began over 40 years ago and uh, it has developed into something uh, quite remarkable, particularly around the ethos of decolonization. That is um, not uh, uh, introducing powerful Western clinicians uh, as the of being on the top of the pile or on top of the pyramid of power but actually uh, understanding that our role as Western people is to support the Nepali clinicians. And um, this particular community that you'll see, uh, uh, I, the clinic itself is 40 years old, but I've worked with this particular community in the, uh, in the clinic for uh, 20 years. So it's, um, it's a family. And uh, in that family, some of the people have grown up to be doctors and nurses from having been uh, so-called kitchen boys. It's pretty exciting to see um, what has happened by keeping ourselves uh, in an attitude of relative humility as we enter into this uh, collaborative experience of pilgrimage of service and a profound mutuality. Perfect introduction, Roshi, thank you. Um, shall I play the video? Yeah, I'm ready to okay. go back to Humla. <laughs> yeah, so this is from, this video is from last year's, uh, wait, last year, two years ago, trip to Humla, Nepal. This is the far Northwestern region um, where most of our crew are from. And so the people that Roshi talked about that we uh, worked with, or that she worked with for decades now, um, and that I've had the privilege of, of uh, walking beside for eight years, eight years ago, I think, was, or seven years ago was the first one. Uh, so it's, it's really cool to see kind of where their homeland is. We don't always go here. Uh, in fact, this was the only the first time I, I went to Humla, but Roshi's been there, it must have been a dozen times. And this will just get a flavor of what one nomad's clinic was like. Thank you, Noah. That's so wonderful. Thank you. And I am, uh, apologies to if the video was jerky. I got some reports it was too jerky. So please feel free to go to the, the link I posted um, and check it out later um, to get a sense of the, the space. And uh, yeah, so and Roshi, kind of said this at the beginning, but I just love this quote um, by her. Altruism at its best is a radical expression of connection, concern, inclusivity, and a sense of responsibility 
Regarding the well-being of others, it is about consciously not robbing others of their autonomy by helping or fixing them. It is about the realization that our own survival is not separate from the survival of others. So interdependence uh, incarnate, you could say. And here the picture is of a, a gracelet. Uh, I think we stopped making these a while ago, so they're probably, <laughs> but there probably might be a few around um, grace programs coming up in, in a little bit for those who want to join. But uh, that sense of, of inter interdependence and, and interreliance, I think, is, is what we really bring to nomads. And, um, and how we work, you know, with the people, both with our own crew, with each other, and then the people who whom we serve. Uh, it's all, it's all. Everybody's, you know, part of that mandala. Do you want to say anything about this, Roshi? No, I, I think the magnitude of this endeavor is uh, probably um, uh, hard to conceive of. Um, there are a uh, um, hundred animals transporting medical supplies and between 100 and 120 people, um, which include uh, Nepali clinicians and Western clinicians and a uh, support team of Nepalis and Westerners and then two cook teams and then horsemen and mule men and Sherpas and then also medical interpreters. So it, it, <laughs> We prepare uh, for an entire year. We come back uh, in November or late October sometime. And we learn so much um, in you know, each of the pilgrimages from our Nepali collaborators. And we uh, debrief deeply. And then we begin the preparation uh, for the next year. So um, Noah is going to move us through some images of some clinics just to give you a feeling. And I want to give a shout out to Patagonia, who um, has donated food and also waterproof jackets, because uh, many times people in the villages and also some of our crew members really don't have adequate gear. So here you see everybody is entire attired in Patagonia's except for Dr. Charlie. Uh -oh. no, he's, he's wearing, he's wearing Patagonia, but it, it's just not one of the gifted oh, ones. Okay, good. I, I think. <laughs> I, I, I don't remember. Anyway, <laughs> um, it's kind of one of the cool things. And also, uh, Little sons, Oliver Eliasson, uh, who is a great artist, who's uh, uh, Danish Icelandic, invented a beautiful solar lamp. And over the years, we have literally given thousands of these away to people in Dolpo and also now people in Humla. So I'm so grateful for those donations and many other, you know, uh, uh, donations uh, come to us as well that we bring across the water and share with um, our extraordinary collaborators and support team. Okay. And, that, and, that, and that, thank you, Roshi. And yeah, and that's exactly the, the kind of the angle we wanted to take for tonight to show our collaborators and support team and, and how the, the Nepali people whom we work with are really the main, um, the main reason we go and, and what, you know, who really carries the work there, even when we're not there. And, and, um, and so I wanted to show more pictures of them and kind of stories of how they interact with the clinic uh, as we go through. So here's the whole team at the beginning of the, the Huma trip, well, almost the whole team. It, it kind of ebbs and flows over the, the months that we're on the trail. Um, and then uh, this is from a previous year, but just a sense of how a camp is set up from nothing. Um, let's see, hopefully this is not too jerky too, but you know, the, we've got our 60, 70, 80, 100 mules and horses with all of the gear that Roshi was mentioning and this miraculous kind of popping up, like I think uh, Bill W said, like, like mushrooms on a log <laughs> of our yellow tents. Um, and then in the, oops, let's see. Okay, and then here's a, and then the clinics themselves when we when we have them are, um, we have about six or seven of them over the course of the month. And let's see, is this playing? This is just a time-lapse of the line. And what's interesting is, as Bill notes in his book, is the, his forthcoming book, is that 
the line never seems to get longer or shorter, even though it's constantly moving, like a standing wave or something. And this is actually a kind of direct example of that. And we have a triage table where Prem, uh, who you'll hear a bit more about later, is our kind of main person who the intake where people come and explain like what ailments they have and they get a slip of paper and um, and then go and then a runner, usually one of us, uh, unskilled medical, non-medical people will take the person to the clinic. And then on the other side, this is facing the other direction for this particular clinic. You can see some of what's going on. We've got nurse Julie's doing uh, yoga instruction. And there's a lot of the, you know, a lot of the, this, the kind of the service that we do is not so much what you'd call like normal Western medical interventions. And, and, and we do have some of that, but we also really try to meet people and uh, learn from them and show them, you know, what we might know, like yoga and stuff. Hold yeah. on. The foot washing station. Yeah, oh, yeah. Some of you have read in, in my book, Standing at the Edge, and also in Bill DeBuise's new book, which um, uses the Nomads Clinic as a focus. It's just an incredible book. It'll be out this summer. Um, but one of the it things is. we do is we wash everybody's feet. And it's really a powerful experience to see, you know, have a Westerner on his knees, um, you know, touching the feet of um, our people, the people who are coming for treatment. And it's an extremely uh, tender, uh, loving, intimate uh, act and exchange that um, is transformative for both the men and it's primarily our men who did the foot washing, a lawyer in this case and a writer. <laughs> and, and that's Bill right there doing the, can you see my mouse when I do this? Yeah, so there's Bill and uh, yeah, yeah, that's a cool one. So washing some feet. One of my favorite things was with Dopal Tuku Rinpoche who came with us one year. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's the head uh, monastic of the whole region, the head Lama teacher um, and is revered. And some people have never even seen him, but they have photographs of him on their altars. And he disguised himself in, in a colorful wig and wore some clothes and was doing the foot washing. And people would go and just get their feet washed. And then they'd realize that it was Dopal Tukur Rinpoche washing their feet. And they would just just about faint, I think. And some people just couldn't handle it. It was really sweet to see that him do that. Um, and then this is just another quick thing of the, the breakdown. So not all the camps are, you know, in, in big fields where we have the clinics. This is just on the trail. You see, we're just on this kind of jutting cliff. And it was, that was a cold night, if I remember. But even there, we had some people come, some real nomads um, seeking help with, with things and the clinicians go out and see what they need and try to help. This is a, um, a a screenshot of kind of my iPhoto library of um, a project we did one year where we I took a picture of all of the, the forms that they they filled out the triage tables filled out and all the people and each of them have a number that's why they're holding their hand up there's a, a number that's written onto their hand so that we can keep track of the people and what their ailments were and they go through this process and um, and this was just kind of an interesting like view. This is maybe one tenth of all the people we saw that year, which was like a thousand people. And then one of the advantages of this particular system is that the people in the mountains in the wintertime often migrate either to Pokhara or to Kathmandu. And though we're not there in the winter, Dolpol Rimpche has a winter clinic. And also Dr. Purbu, whose dental office we uh, funded, and uh, Dr. Sonam and uh, Pema Gyalpo and others, uh, including uh, Amchi, uh, uh, they're all in Kathmandu in the winter. So they, we have records of the people when they come down from the mountains of how the, you know, what the diagnosis was and what the treatment. And then they you know, seek medical help from uh, our team in, when they're in Kathmandu. And this is a particularly large clinic. Or no, this was a, was this a puja, Roshi? Was this when you were giving out little sons? 
a huge clinic up at high altitude very early in the trip. It just was very challenging. We're up, I think, at about, I don't know, 15 or 16 or 17,000 feet on this incredible ridge with this solitary gompa. And, you know, a thousand people came out of the valleys uh, up in order to receive the blessing and, and to receive the menstrual kits and to uh, um, get little sons and to have their teeth taken care of. And it was very powerful and interesting. And it was quite, quite a challenge for us, actually. Mm -hmm. We almost lost one of our members. Oops, you guys muted. We almost lost one of our members, uh, Western members, um, who got very sick in altitude. We had to have her evacuated. It was very intense up there. But so far, you know, we've all managed. <laughs> Thanks, Roshi. And, and so now I wanted to show a little bit about each kind of segment. Um, we usually have different clinics. We call them different clinics within their tents, you know, where where we go and we send the people uh, who come and the patients. So feminine hygiene and women's education, there's a lot more to it than just that. But this is one of the, um, the beautiful examples of this is nurse Wangmo who came in um, and who's just sh shown and, and become a real leader uh, of the nomads clinic and, and takes care of the, the winter clinic also and it's doing so many things and here she's um, describing men menstrual cycles and how to use the menstrual kits that we give out uh, to women, to nomadic women in the, um, in Rani Karka, right, Roshi? It was Rani Karka, I think. And then one of the interesting things about this part of the project is that um, we are able to support uh, women who live uh, in a small, very poor village outside of Kathmandu to actually sew the menstrual kits. So uh, it, there's a, you know, it's not as if we get the menstrual kits in a drugstore commercially. Um, we're able to actually support uh, mm -hmm. a whole village of women um, who are, are uh, producing these kits. And these kits now have been distributed all over Dolpo and they're distributed throughout the year. This is um, uh, in uh, a, a nunnery. Uh, you see, they're all Tibetan nuns. They've had no menstrual education at all. Um, and so as a result of this, they were so shy, but so incredibly grateful to learn about the menstrual cycle and also how to take care of their bodies during uh, their periods. And you can see Ang Mo, she, and this is Ang Mo and uh, me and uh, Dr. Lau, but the, the nuns are just lit up. It's really and trying to hide And a little bit trying to hide some of them. We actually just... <laughs> ordered another 600 kits to distribute to some of the villages that we haven't distributed to before. And so that's in the works right now. And, and, and Wendy, the, these kits, they're totally reusable and washable, right? And they're, they're not- They're all made of beautiful cloth. I don't know if you have a picture of it, but it's- um, I don't have a close up. Um, it actually includes underwear um, because most people there don't wear underwear, so it wouldn't work without it. It's just um, a cloth with uh, a, a washable cloth uh, that's folded inside it, and everything is washable and reusable um, and, and organic, actually. That last couple of years has been organic cotton. So. That's so cool. I mean, so we have distributed through Angmo and uh, a few others, literally thousands of these kids. I mean, how many? Um, I don't even remember anymore. Probably tens of thousands. Actually, probably right? tens of thousands of these kids. Yeah. It's just, it's just one of the wonderful things for women to learn about their uh, bodies. Yeah. Um, since their bodies are, you know, covered in heavy clothes and something that um, gets very neglected and extremely used. Yeah, and, and Angmo did a small uh, research project two years ago and had did some interviews with women and asked them, you know, what they knew about their their menstrual cycle. And most people don't really, haven't really been exposed and were too shy to ask. So they were just really grateful to be able to, to learn about it. And uh, before this, they would use just maybe a rag or they're not able to go to school or they're not able to work. 
because there's not really, you know, a support around that. And there's a little bit of a stigma around it also. Well, I'd say more not than a little, little bit, bit yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, in this region of Humla in the southern part, there are, quotes, menstrual huts. And so, uh, and though they are now illegal in, in Nepal, they still, uh, the, that practice of isolating a uh, menstruating girl or woman in a hut uh, at the time of her period, um, in, it's, re it's really bad. Or they're put down in uh, the area where the animals are. So, you know, the whole process around uh, women's fertility, menstrual cycles, uh, birth giving is something we've been very concentrated on and also fertility control. As you'll see, Angmo is will uh, later in the slides. You'll see her doing um, implants. So, uh, Angmo, there's just a, a close-up picture of her. It's just this brilliant shining star of nomads who <laughs> we're in touch with frequently, and she's so kind of humble and um, and just down to earth, and and yet she just gets so much done. So she was, uh, she's just a stellar nurse. And she, Wendy, yeah. you can- Should we talk about her yeah, right now? Yeah, okay, sure. Maybe yeah, she, she is a nurse and she actually came from the, uh, the region of Do, which is a really high village and like 13,000 feet that we've been to a few times. She grew up there and um, eventually just, she's just brilliant. And um, she went to Kathmandu to study and then she became a nurse. And through Nomad, she's learned, you know, learned that public health is so important and that's her her passion and she really wants to really help her people up in Opo um, to get more services and and to grow like health um, post and ha health um, programs. So she really wanted to go to public health school and um, over the last few years she's been talking to us about it when we we're on the trip and now she's actually at the University of Washington Global Health School um, and getting her MPH. Um, unfortunately, during the pandemic, she can't come. So she's doing it online, but hopefully she will actually come in a couple months. And it's, she, and, and, and uh, you know, we got her at, at first, we, you know, we're able to line up funding for her, for her school and everything. But after, you know, just half a quarter, because she's so brilliant and was just acing all her classes, they just waived all her. Please. Her she's now wow. going free. So we're looking forward to her coming out and, you know, just shining even brighter. Yeah. Amazing. So there she is. And there you are too, Wendy, I think, with a newborn. Oh, uh, kangaroo. Kangarooing. Um, we're just teaching the mother how to uh, give warmth to the, to the baby and it, it comforts the baby when you have them skin to skin. This is a, unfortunately a very uh, premature and very, very small baby. There's not much um, maternal health out up there. In fact, there's no maternal health out up there. And there's also a weird stigma of um, not telling others about their their pregnancy and so not being able to get help. So Angmo, this is actually Angmo's uh, biggest passion is to um, educate mothers and educate the women in, in the villages to give better uh, uh, pre pre birth kind of healthcare and getting vitamins and um, you know how to actually uh, give birth to how to um, you know receive the birth. The, there's not not pretty much no one that's trained up there except for maybe one or two people and not throughout the year. So there's a lot of maternal. Uh, more mortality and morbi morbidity of the of the mother and also the child. Um, Angmo has some uh, pretty harrowing stories of of birthing children up in in the mountains. So this is her big her big uh, passion. And you can see it on her face in these um, like here's well she's not in this one but in these photographs of her teaching the women and and uh, and girls. Uh, about all all the different things that she teaches them, she has this joy and delight in sharing that uh, wisdom, which could really help help people. So, and then relatedly, um, the another clinic has to do with the kids. So first the birth, and then the kids. We see here this is in um, Saldan, which is way up north in, in the Dolpa region, but it's one of the bigger villages. 
and we just we want to see everybody uh, that we can and so we line them up and do these um, oh here's a mother with some prenatal vitamins that were given by vitamin angels one of the sponsors um, and they just go through and it, so you can see is that four five nurses in a row doing 100 kids I think or more than 100 kids and just checking on everything everybody gets deworming medication um, and uh, and then a general health checkup and we call this well checks well check and they're just so cute another another thing that we're doing is the h pylori testing because it's such a um, uh, and it's a little blood prick and you can test and see if somebody has this uh, bacteria bacterium which causes gastric and intestinal issues and is one of the kind of main causes for gastritis in the, in the region or is it 40 percent of people gastric cancer okay yeah. Do you want to say more about that, Wendy? Well, here's actually, this is Pema Gyalpo, who comes from the Dolpo, uh, not the Dolpo, the Gorka region from a village called Prok. And when we were working up in uh, the Gorka region, um, he's stepped into Nomad's Clinic and has been there ever since. And he's traveled to Mustang and uh, all over Dolpo and Homlo with us. But maybe talk a little bit about H. pylori. Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh... It's a bacteria that causes, uh, is an infection of the stomach that actually causes a lot of problems, mostly like ulcers at first, and then it can cause um, stomach cancer. Um, and that's really endemic in the, in the region. I think over the last few years that we've been testing and treating for it, I think we are getting two thirds yeah. positive, which is a lot. So we've, we basically um, prepare all these uh, treatment, which is a lot of different uh, medications together. And it's a little bit difficult to take. So we have pictures and of how to take it and, and, you know, good instructions. And, um, and uh, we've gone back to those villages and, and checked on people and people, a lot of people's gastric uh, uh, symptoms have gone away after that. That's so cool. And then one of our, another shining light is Dr. Purwu, who is our dentist. Uh, and Roshi met him on one trip and like now we can't get rid of him, you know? He's, <laughs> I have more pictures of Purwu than anyone. But how did you meet him, Roshi? We were, we were done and we were, you know, walking from Ringmo back to, uh, you know, where the airstrip is a couple of days walk. I was just beaten up. And somebody came and I was trying to rest in my tent. Somebody came running and said, Roshi, Roshi, there's a dentist. And I thought, oh, well, you dentist. No, no, a Nepali dentist. Mm -hmm. And I walked out and there was Dr. Purbu. He was going up while we were coming down. We made this total heart connection. And um, we decided that he should be our, our dentist. And as a result of that, um, he has, it's, it's just unbelievable. I couldn't believe that, you know, oh yeah, we get to bring a dental chair, okay, on a mule, all right. He is just a magician in the wilds and he's super athletic. He's actually from the most Northern area of Gorka, uh, area called Sum. And um, he became a dentist because his father had terrible teeth. There's no dental hygiene. His brother went to New York, became a cabbie and earned enough money to send Dr. Porbu to dental school in Bangalore. And then we funded the opening of his office in Kathmandu so he could treat the mountain people when they came down from the mountains. And here, and he is just pure gold, absolute gold. It, I remember when we, he was first coming on and he was like asking for all these things like, oh, we need to get a dental chair. We need to get a pressure cooker to sterilize the the things and we need like a I think he even had, had like a dental drill and I was looking at the power needs and I just thought is this really going to happen and then look at this I mean he was he pulled how many dozens of teeth and uh, he's the one who like you know stays the longest in every clinic because yeah he's, he's there till dark teeth problems. And, and Wes always forget how much suffering a, a toothache can cause and a toothache oh my gosh can cost for years and years. Some people have like toothache for years, basically, when they see him. Or they and, die of sepsis. Yeah, or they die of some okay. kind of, yeah. So he's passionate about healing those teeth and also in teaching people how to brush so that they don't get that, those problems. So we take um, 
thousands of toothbrushes. Everybody uh, who comes into the clinic plus gets a toothbrush. Right there. Yeah, it's right at the either at the beginning or at, and when we were collecting all the information about people, we had it at the end as a kind of, so we knew that they had gone through the whole clinic and we'd give them their gift bag, which included a toothbrush, I think. And he's just also buckets of fun as well as being super fit and then super intelligent. And, uh, you know, brushing your teeth is a fun thing if you've ever really noticed what you're doing. <laughs> Plus his dental assistants, they're just so great. Pema and others who come with so us year nice. after year. Huh? And so nice. so um, You know, it's, as I said, it's like a family and they really are in the lead. And it's so em empowering for us to um, learn how to work in this kind of really uh, unusual setting. Yeah. With next next to nothing. Yeah. And so another part of what we do is the, the reading glasses and sunglasses. And another one of our, our close family is, is Norbu. And here he's, so we bring reading glasses that are um, partially donated by, um, I'm forgetting the name of the company, but they have these donated glasses that they provide at a very low cost. So we bring thousands of, of reading glasses and sunglasses. And there's a, a reading chart right there. Um, is it restoring vision? Is that what they're called? Anyway, he's doing a, um, a reading test so that people can be fitted for the right uh, power of glasses. And, if, and fun is involved there too. That's actually the wig that I was talking about that Double Tuku was wearing when he was <laughs> disguised washing feet. I think they're um, doing a needle threading test actually. So all the older ladies, would try to thread the needle and then if they get the right glasses they're able to actually thread it and it's so uh, beautiful. Yeah, that's great. Here's another picture of Marabu fitting some of the glasses. Photo by Kira Kroll. Some wonderful photography here. And here's a and the sunglasses with the fashion mode sticker. <laughs> some of these sunglasses are great. Um, that you'll see people wearing. And I, I wonder if we go back, you know, another time, are we going to see them there still? With the stickers on. <laughs> Put the stickers on. And then so tradition, so Amchi means doctor in Tibetan. And so Amchi medicine is the, the traditional medicine. And we, we always uh, bring in Amchi. And this is Amchi Gyatso, who is now kind of retired from No Man's Clinic. But he came for years to, um, uh, with Roshi on these trips. Um, and he was the oh. doctor for the king of Mustang. And mm. he's, uh, you know, the great trainer in this uh, tradition of Amchi medicine. He was also the head of the Amchi, the Himalayan Amchi Association. And he, all of his children, whether they're males or females, all of them became Amchis. And he has a whole school. And that medicine it has really, you know, it's part of the tradition but it is so powerful to um, include, you know, where uh, we're doing with our Nepali counterparts, Western medicine, but to understand that uh, the Amji tradition, um, which is very sophisticated in terms of herbs and pressure points and um, reading of the subtle signs of the tongue and the urine and uh, also uh, pulse diagnosis. So, you know, it would seem like, for example, people would be um, more uh, oriented toward coming into sort of the Western part. So we always sent people first to the Amchis because uh, it's a way for us to, you know, learn about that medicine. But it's also, you know, how much we respect that medicine. And um, it's part of that culture. And it's the main resource for people who live in these very remote regions. And one of the things that um, was so cool when I talked to Amchi Gyatso in, in Mustang in 2014 was I was asking him how he does his, his work. And of course, there's the pulse um, diagnosis, which he's doing right there. But what I found or what he explained was that it really has to do with a meditative presence. And the Dharma is completely integrated into the, the Amchi style of, of um, doing medicine. And that um, without 
the kind of meditative presence that he brings, he said he wouldn't be able to do what he does. And so as, uh, you know, as practitioners of Buddhism or whatever um, contemplative tradition, to know that at the root of, um, of the healing arts, at least in that region, and perhaps at the root of, the, as it should be for us, um, the root of the healing arts should be this, this uh, space of um, equanimity and uh, meditative yeah. presence. Well, one of the things that we do is we ask our Western clinicians to go into uh, Amchi Lundup or Amchi Gautso's uh, clinic and just to sit there and to really feel what it is to um, experience meditative presence as the Amchi is uh, in connection with uh, his patients. And that's exactly what Noah said too. We, every time we go, when we first go in, sometimes we, as Western doctors, we want to figure out what's going on. We're like, oh, how do you do this? What, what are you touching? What are you, what are you hearing? What's going on? But then as you sit for a little bit longer, you realize there's a whole other thing, the, the, the meditative presence that's so present in that tent and with that connection between the, the, the practitioner and, and the patient. It's really beautiful. And we're so lucky that though Amchi Gyatso retired, his, his son Amchi Lindrup, who is also a great Amchi, uh, is, has been with us for several years now and hopefully will continue to be for many years to come. And you can see his, um, his Amchi medicine there by his side. And then I love this next picture you can see. Here's that space that he's in. And uh, with uh, this is Roshi actually getting a, um, a pulse reading. And he really, he was like, I started taking pictures and he kind of, he was like a little um, noticing me at first. And then it was just like, and he was like in this zone, which was so cool. Here's uh, Amchi Lindrup again with, and once he does the diagnosis, then he kind of prescribes the medicine. These are these, oh, how many herbs and um, substances do these have? Like hundreds, right? When do you do that? And part of the work is to going uh, is going with um, the students in the Amchi school to the higher altitudes and to actually collect and, and process the herbs. Yeah. Little sums, as Roshi mentioned before, this is actually became a, a big part of uh, the Nomads Clinic was giving out these solar lights in, um, in these regions where there is no electricity. I don't know if we mentioned this, there's no electricity uh, generally almost no electricity there's like some people have little solar panels um there are no motors or, or gas engines or anything uh, that's all changing of course as as the roads start being built but in most of the places we go there's really nothing and so these um nothing like that and so these lights can be very useful uh for reading for doing sewing work and you know you can imagine a dimly lit house that only has like a candle or a firelight that these would be very welcome and you can charge them in the sun. And so we always bring uh, hundreds or thousands even of these and give them out to, to villagers. And of course, everybody wants five. And so we try to make it, we talk to like the village head man. And this is another way we enter relationship. The village head people who uh, can organize the families and say, okay, one per family so that each family can get a little sun. And we have these examples of kids using them. Is carrying them out in the dark one evening, and uh, and you'll see that our, our crew, our kitchen crew, who uses we use these little sun in the kitchen at, at night um, before we give them away, and so they have to charge them. So every day they're carrying them on their packs, you know, like this, and uh, just this incredible view. And so this brings us to a part of the. Um, of the slideshow I just wanted to, oh, we're kind of out of time, aren't we? It's already 6.30. Um, so we don't have to talk about pilgrimage, right, Roshi? Well, you know, the one thing I do want to say is for those of us who are Westerners, it is a pilgrimage. And I think for many of our Nepali colleagues, it is also a pilgrimage because they feel as we do that we're doing sacred work and sacred work together and we're also going to sacred sites. And um, in the 
gompas in the temples. And one of the really, this photograph is kind of interesting. We're uh, at this huge uh, temple on top of a ridge at about 16,000 feet. And Dolpa Rinpoche always asks me to take a high seat. As an example, he's a feminist, as an example to the women um, that women uh, deserve much respect. So I, you know, I have to give talks and mm -hmm. sit in these pujas for hours doing, I'm doing shikantaza. They're, you know, in doing what they do. But it's just such a privilege to be able to do this. Yeah. And this is the other. So this was that the thing we started with with all those people on the cliffside, right, Roshi? So yeah. you did the puja, you did the little sun giveaway, you did a huge clinic. And on this particular nomads clinic, the man standing to my right is actually the abbot of She Gompa, and he went with us the whole way, as did Dolpa Rinpoche and various other uh, monks. It was really, really fantastically fun to um, be, you know, in the pujas and also to have these very wild holy men uh, teaching us along the way. Mm -hmm. um, so do you want to skip to the end for the, the yeah. people in Nepal? Yeah. We'll just go through these quickly. Just there's so many stories we could tell. That's quite a story. Yeah. Um, and just the, the kind of grandeur of the space and meditating every morning uh, with Roshi and, and uh, spiritual teachers who come these kind of these days between clinics where it's hard, you know, we're hiking up, we're not used to these altitudes and it just clears you of, um, you know, the stuff that usually clouds your mind. And then you can come into these clinics with that presence, with all the presence you can bring the beauty that you've experienced on the trail and the pain and it's humbling uh, and it's beautiful. And so I, I'm so grateful to have come. Uh -oh. I think we lost you Noah. Know, all your friends, there's Amshiga, so. Yeah. Oops, where did you lose me? Am I back? You're back. And, you know, I think that Wendy and Noah and I and Charlie, and this is, uh, Pema Gyalpo and Dr. Sonam and Amji Lundup, you know, we're so close. We've been through so much together. We bonded, you know, as a singular community. You know, we say one body. Truly, this is an experience of one body where we're all taking care of each other and also serving um, villagers who are extraordinarily resilient and who teach us about what it is to you know, experience extreme illness, but not whine. Be able to, you know, really, they have such strong backs and such open fronts. And I think that Wendy, Noah, and I, is, you know, because we're here in Santa Fe, um, we, you know, we kind of look at each other with uh, this kind of longing. Um, the mountains are beautiful, the customs are beautiful, but it's the people's heart that uh, that draws us year after year. And it's not so much what we're able to give, it's actually what we're given. Yeah. And during the time when we're not out there, um, the work continues. And so we just have a couple um, things to tell you about what Wang Mo is up to, uh, Wendy. Yeah. She's in touch with Wendy on WhatsApp and we get these pictures, which are just so inspiring. And, and Kathmandu right now uh, with the University of Washington. But this is last summer when everything was closed down. She decided there was a project that we really wanted to do is to vaccinate um, people in, in Dolpo for uh, hepatitis B. Um, she went up there and tested, I think, 1,500 people for hepatitis B. Maybe like 350 of those were actually positive. And then she treated the rest with uh, with uh, vaccines. So it was a big project. She also brought, you know, uh, cloth mask and taught about the pandemic and what it means and helped uh, the villages come up with a quarantine um, a scheme and and a plan um, and and help them realize how how you know dire the situation is um, to not let tourists through. So she's. She was up there for a few months last summer doing this. It was, 
and, and, and continuing this work. And this is a photograph of uh, a young woman that, um, uh, who got diagnosed in the early part of the clinic the in first, Homla, the first the clinic. The first patient, actually. At, she was the first patient. And tell that story. Please. Yeah, she, she was the first patient of that year. Um, we were just settling into the first camp and having dinner it was already dark. And someone came up to me and was like, that some somebody's bringing a really sick uh, young woman. Um, she's gonna die. So it can can you guys see her? And we're like, oh, of course. So we set up you know lights in the balcony and and saw her. And she came in. She was so small. She was looked like we thought she was twelve, but she's actually sixteen. Um, and uh, she couldn't breathe. She couldn't walk. She has a big protruding belly. Um, she was having a hard time. You can see she's not doing well. We had an ultrasound with us and was able to see that her whole belly was um, basically one solid mass. We didn't really, we couldn't diagnose it at that time, but we knew she was super, really, really sick. So we immediately asked them to um, evacuate, e evacuate her. her. Um, we gave them enough uh, money to get down to Kathmandu. Dr. Sonam, who you know worked at Kathmandu and has colleagues there, set her up for diagnosis and and uh, and whatever that's needed and we set her up with a her and her uh, dad here uh, with a family to stay with and um, she got down there and they diagnosed her and it was basically tapeworm um, in the liver she's had this since she was eight um, so had been you know not doing well for so many years and not be able to go to school and she's her family's been trying to get her to get treated they tried to raise money from the village and was only able to raise $60. And so that wasn't en enough. So they gave it back. And so they were just kind of at the end of their, 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 their hope. Um, and this is her after surgery and treatment and uh, with her dad going back to the village. Yeah, how many pounds was the tumor? It was huge. It was very, yeah. very big. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot. It was the si I remember it was the size of a football, basically. The tumor was caused by the tapeworm. Yeah, and right. it it basically could have been something that could have been treated with you know ten dollars worth of medicine ten years ago when she first got it, but unfortunately wasn't right. able to um, get that treatment earlier. And that's one of the things that we do is um, all of all of the people get deworming medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Noah. And then we've got our our great friend Prem. Uh, who is continuing the work and um, bringing food and supplies to the Rohingya refugees. Yeah. And also um, last summer, you know, with our support, he was able to do a big, oh here, yeah, food. In this case, uh, also we, through um, the Pende Foundation, we are able to provide blankets uh, in the wintertime for all the Rohingya refugee families. These are, you know, people who've escaped Myanmar, come into Bangladesh and made it all the way uh, into Nepal, where they receive no support and have no status at all. So um, we've basically been feeding um, the Rohingya camps for since uh, 2015 and um, providing medical and dental care through our Nepali team. Thank you. And then another project that Prem's involved in is the rebuilding of the stupa uh, here in Humla, which was a great uh, community kind of coming together. Wendy? Yeah, um, a lot of our crew members, uh, who are Nepali crew members are from that region. And, and since we didn't go this year, a lot of them basically didn't have an income during that time. And just in general, Nepal didn't have any tourist um, uh, tourist uh, business. So um, Prem wanted to, you know, do a project that's sacred, but also able to feed the, the people there. So he um, gathered the crew, um, was able to pay them, feed them, and build the stupa, which is amazing. Do, do you remember where it was exactly? Yeah, it's near Torpa. Yeah. And you know, it's one of those places that um, uh, because of the roads had been partially destroyed. And so that, you know, the work that he's doing has to do with cultural restoration. If we're so grateful to support. So 
So that's all the slides and thank you all so much. And thank you, Roshi and Wendy for joining on this and telling the stories. Uh, it's just so inspiring to hear that the work is ongoing. And I don't know if you wanna say anything about our plans. Um, I'll just put it here in the, if anybody wants to donate to Nomads Clinic, because I, I got a couple of requests. I'll put this in uh, in the chat stream while you finish, Roshi. You know, I think the most important part of the work has been this experience of uh, collegiality, that um, it's not a bunch of white people or well-educated people going to Nepal and doing good things. It really is um, an experience of profound collaboration and deep respect where we feel um, uplifted and instructed. And also um, we've been able to uh, learn so much about these high altitude cultures. Um, and, you know, we, we have this kind of joke, which we say, uh, no whining, um, because the people in the high altitudes are so resilient, have such incredible humor, um, live with uh, so little compared to us. It's kind of embarrassing. You know, we have these big duffel bags filled with stuff. And that, you know, you feel, like, oh, this is um, our consumerism, our insecurity. And it really brings a, a focus or a lens, puts a lens on our life that um, I think nothing else could put on our life than being in these extremely uh, remote high altitude villages with people who have the kind of, of vigor and resilience and humor that uh, I'd love to see, you know, a little bit more in our culture. We don't know if we can return in uh, in September because of the pandemic, um, but our team on the Nepali side continues to work every single day to benefit um, in uh, what they're doing in, in terms of the dental care, medical care, and cultural restoration. And what one of the most beautiful things is to see how um, that uh, um, the people on our team are from Gorka, uh, the Kumbu area, um, Mustang, uh, Dolpo, uh, Humla, and probably one other region. And they've all bonded into a family. And so one of the things that, you know, every few days I get photographs from, uh, you know, they're at some restaurant in Kathmandu all together, or they're doing a puja, or they're circumambulating the Mahabodhi stupa. And it's been a really deeply unifying experience where people live in these distinct regions, but um, have, because we worked in different regions, and we've kind of picked up the cool people um, for uh, their nursing skills or various other skills, and made this intercultural team. So it is very, very wonderful. But I don't know if we can go back, but they're doing the work for us. So that is part of what I feel is really important, that it's not about colonizing, it is decolonization. It is this experience of really uh, appreciating profoundly the capacities of the people whom you're serving. And you realize actually um, you're being served through that exchange. Oh, Angmo is on YouTube. Oh, Angmo's on YouTube. That's so, that's so yeah, great. I told her, I, I was oh. like, if you're online, we're talking about you. Oh. <laughs> Can you send her the, the Zoom link? Yeah. So anyway, it, yeah. And I see Eileen, who's in Australia. Hi, Eileen. She, Eileen's lived up in these regions for many years and re, really you know, knows how tough it is, but also how completely uplifting it is. And no whining. <laughs> yeah. All right, so, my friends, I'm so happy. Um, we're meeting the collegial stewards in the morning and then uh, in the afternoon at five o'clock mountain time. Uh, most of you will be in your uh, collegial groups. We're still on, sorry, Bruce, we're still on YouTube. Do you want to say goodbye to YouTube and then come back to the SEBT? <laughs> Bye, you. Thank you everyone for joining on, on YouTube, those of you who aren't in the training. And we'll end now and uh, continue with the, let's see where. Oh, I don't have the, oh, you Piazen Center stole host away again.
anyway sure, you, can you close the youtube yeah anyway uh there's nothing more unless you have any questions we could spend just a few minutes if you have any questions you could 